Mohsen Hamid was born in 1971 in Lahore, Pakistan. He moved to California at age three and lived there for six years while his dad worked on his PhD at Stanford. At age nine, in 1980, he moved back to Pakistan and remained there until 1989, when he came back to the U.S. again to attend Princeton, where he then graduated summa cum laude and studied under novelists Toni Morrison and Joyce Carol Oates. After completing his degree at Harvard Law School, he spent the next couple decades balancing work in the U.K. with McKinsey and senior brand agencies, together with taking months off each year to write novels. What novels they are. His first novel, Moth Smoke, came out in the year 2000, told the story of an ex-banker and heroin addict in contemporary Lahore. His second novel, which was my first one, actually, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, came out in 2007. Um, it's a second-person account. Second person, like the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Second-person account of a Pakistani man's abandonment of his high-flying life in New York. His third novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, came out in 2013. This is my favorite of Mohsen Hamid's books. It is a fascinating exploration of urbanization and glo- global economic transformation wrapped in the guise of a self-help book. His fourth novel, Exit West, came out in 2017. Perhaps his most famous, it follows refugees escaping from war-torn homes through a chain of mysterious doors. And his fifth novel, The Last White Man, comes out on August 2nd, 2022, just a few days from today's new moon. Mohsen Hamid's books have been published in over 40 languages, sold millions of copies, and been turned into movies, and they have been shortlisted for notable prizes like the Penn Hemingway Prize and the Man Booker Prize, multiple times. Mohsen has been named one of the world's 100 leading global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine, and his writing regularly appears in some shabby publications like the New York Times, The Guardian, The Financial Times, and The Paris Review. Mohsen lives with his wife, Zara, and their children in Lahore, Pakistan, which is where he joins us from today. Okay, Wi-Fi instructions have been given. <laughs> I like how you didn't say that they've been followed. That's good. No, That's no, good differentiation. I want to be sure they listen to. I, I was given a few <laughs> orders. Is what my kids want delivered for dinner tonight. Um, so, uh, oh man! But, okay. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Okay, great. So, Mosin, thank you so much for for coming on three books. This is a real huge. Um, I, I've been looking forward to this for so long. I have. I've read and loved all of your books, including them up to page 128 right now of uh, your newest book, The Last White Man, which I have right beside me in printout form because it's not even in galley form yet um, as we speak. And I think we're speaking to, I'm in Toronto, Canada. I'm in my basement, kind of like, you know, dim light. I've got a, a wow sign behind me made out of Rubik's Cubes. I'm at a brown desk. Um, can you give us, just for people listening, just a little scene skeep of where you are, both both city, country, what's outside your window, physically and metaphorically speaking. Well, thank you, uh, Neil. It's a pleasure to be with you. And at the moment, I am sitting uh, in Pakistan, in Lahore, uh, in my study, uh, which was my grandparents' study um, when this house was built. And uh, over the years, um, it's been inhabited by various members of my extended family. Um, I live in it today with with um, with my wife and children, and uh, it's uh, uh, the house is about seventy years old. Um, my kids are the fourth generation of the family to run around here, and uh, the study um, is a tall room with a with a uh, what they call a Russian band, which is not a skylight. It's sort of a a narrow window above the main window. Um, Did you, say Ru- you didn't. You didn't say Russian. You said there was a word you used there. Yeah, it's, it's called in Urdu a Russian dan. I'm not sure what the Russian English term dan. is. It's oh, basically nice. a, a, um, a thinner slit window above the main window, and its purpose was in the summertime you would uh, open it a crack uh, before air conditioning, and hot air would rise and leave the room, uh, keeping the room ah. cool. Uh, now it just has glass in it. So it's just a kind of second window, I suppose. Um, and we have an air conditioner, but, uh, but that was, that was <laughs> yeah. nice. well, you know, it's, I love those old fashioned kind of weather, uh, appendages. There's an old theater in downtown Toronto called the Royal Alexander theater. It's about a hundred year old theater and underneath all the seats, this is for, you know, musicals and stuff. There's grates, open grates. And I asked them why. And they said, you know, a hundred years ago, they put big ice blocks underneath 
and the cold air would give people like fake air conditioning out their feet at, at a fancy theater. Wow, I would have thought it was it was warm air coming in to to make you uh, a little more comfortable in those Canadian winters. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. You never know what could get kind of through the broken telephone over time. Well, you said seventy years. So I kind of traced that back to I guess nineteen fifty two or so. My mom was born in nineteen fifty in Nairobi, Kenya, but her family historically, before she was born, was originally from Lahore. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, That's a crazy small world story. Yeah. And she's never been to Lahore, nor so she's not been to Pakistan, nor India. Sort of, somewhat sadly, but you know, with the Idi Amin and sort of her she, youngest of eight kids, she, she, you know, her family kind of fled East Africa in the early seventies. And I've just only been hearing about these stories kind of verbally. But I'd love to hear from you any sort of context you want to give us about the city of Lahore. Obviously. I mean, I, I read kind of CNN today. It's like Lahore is experiencing a major heat wave and there's all these kids kind of like playing in the river. But this is a city that is a huge global city that my mom's family's from, that you're talking to us from. And I'd love, I'd love some color around it. What, what is the state of Lahore today? And, and, and I guess of Pakistan more at large, just briefly. I, know, I, I don't want to dovetail us too quickly. But- no, I'm, I'm very happy to. Um, so when I was born, Lahore was a, in 1971, Lahore was a city of, I think, about uh, 3 million, maybe less. And now it's north of 12 um, and, and growing rapidly. Uh, it's uh, originally Lahore was um, when uh, you invaded uh, the Indian subcontinent, the South Asian subcontinent <laughs> from Central Asia and, and, and the West, as, as, as one tended to do. Um, and you crossed to the mountains and the Vale of Peshawar. The first big city that you hit uh, coming in, headed towards Delhi, was Lahore. And Lahore... Oh, interesting. Yeah. And what's the year you're talking about? When you say so invaded, you're talking well, like... I mean, you, know, you, you, you invaded all the way from Alexander's time, you know, uh, through, uh, through the Mughals. Um, the British came from the opposite direction, obviously. They came uh, from India word towards uh, 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 Pakistan and, and, and Afghanistan. Um, but, but before that, uh, people used to invade um, from Asia into uh, heading south and east into the subcontinent. Um, wow. They crossed the Karakurams, coming down from Kabul, let's say. Uh, you'd come to Peshawar, a, a city in a valley, and then you'd hit the plains of the Punjab. And the Punjab is called the Punjab because it's five big rivers and Punj for five and Ab for water, the land of the five waters. And, and this is the area, you know, one of the great uh, uh, river civilizations of ancient times was in, was in these parts, you know, Harappa and Manjodaro, uh, contemporary with the, you know, the um, ancient Chinese and Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations. And, and Lahore is more recent than that. You know, it's, it's, nobody's quite sure, but, you know, maybe a couple thousand or thousand to two thousand years old. Um, and it sits just east of the river Ravi one of these five big rivers. And it's its east because invaders would come from the east and this, this uh, glorious fortress awaited them on this side. Um, and the fortress still exists in the Lahore Fort. It's this red brick thing with very thick uh, walls and a big ramp going up to it that, that war elephants would ride up into. And once you conquered Lahore, you had enough money to finance the rest of your conquest of, of you know, what now is North India. Um, and Lahore today is, is still there um, you know, the, the, the incredible fertility of the land from all the flooding of this Himalayan soil that we brought down these rivers remains. So if you plant a tree in Lahore, as, as I've done in a few years, you've got a, you know, 40 foot tall, uh, uh, uh amazing, um, you know, young tree, uh, or wow. 20, 20 foot tall, depending on the, on the, on the kind of tree. You've what planted. kind of, what kind of tree did you well, plant? That's 40 feet tall, three years well, later. I think, you know, if you plant a neem tree, um, uh-huh. be indigenous to here. It hits about, I'd say, twenty feet. It could hit twenty feet in, in good sunlight um, uh, in a few years. And uh-huh. um, and some of the imported trees take much longer because it, I suppose it's less. Um, uh, it's a bit, you know, they're not adapted to this environment quite so well. But anything you plant here will grow. You know, during COVID, wow. we grew tomatoes and eggplant and whatnot in our back lawn, and uh, the kids were enjoying that during lockdown. Um, but basically, so Lahore is this, is this cent- center of a, of a great agricultural area, which is called the Punjab. 
And even now, it's the breadbasket of both uh, Pakistan and India. Uh, the Indian part of Punjab uh, provides a, a big proportion of India's food, the same for the Pakistani part uh, for Pakistan. Um, and, and Lahore sits in the middle of all that and very close to the Indian border because after partition, uh, Lahore wound up um, just 20 or 30 kilometers away from the uh, India-Pakistan border. Um, but it's a sprawling um, city that has stretched out in different directions. And uh, it's spread out, I suppose, more in the manner that Los Angeles or even Toronto is spread out, um, uh, yeah. you know, less in a kind of truly vertical sense. Uh, you know, Toronto still has more of a vertical downtown that's increasingly becoming uh, vertical. Um, Lahore doesn't have that. Lahore goes on and on uh, for a large sprawl. But around me, where I live uh, in Lahore, there are more and more apartment buildings and offices coming up and these old houses are being knocked down and, and you know, shopping plazas and uh, offices, apartments, you know, 16, 20 story buildings are coming up. So um, there's, it, it feels a little bit like when I was a child reading this, um, this there was a children's book about Babar the elephant and, and one of his, yes. one of his stories, you know, the, 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 he, he has to build this kind of wall around his little place that he lives with a bunch of animals and outside is this completely polluted um, overrun gray city and inside this colorful place with lakes and rivers and um, uh, hills and, and grass and trees. Um, it feels a little bit like that for me in Lahore now that all around us uh, is it's increasingly urban, increasingly dense. Uh, but where we live yeah. used to be a, a suburb on, on, the, on the fringes of, of Lahore uh, 70 years ago. Um, and so the houses here wow. are sort of flat bungalows, um, you know, two stories at most. And, uh, you know, uh, um, around us is um, a district that has um, art galleries and restaurants and banks and, um, you know, all the things you would expect in a sort of uh, mm. downtown big city place. You know, you can buy your iPads and your cell phones and your, you know, whey protein powder or whatever stuff it is that you imagine uh, yeah. the yeah. Urban <laughs> city will provide you. You know, it has its yeah. gyms and it has its... You, you, con contraband bottled water, I'm assuming. Yeah, you've got your bottled water and you've got your... <laughs> um, you have all sorts of contraband, in fact. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, it, it, the, the one thing which has is, which is, um, been unfortunate uh, in Lahore is um, it now suffers from catastrophic air pollution. Uh, ah. you know, like Delhi and like some other places um, in the... Yeah northern, you know, uh, Indo-Gangetic plain, the northern parts of Pakistan and India. Um, it's a bit like Los Angeles in the sense that you have these giant mountains, the Himalayas. And so the air is coming up from the south and it comes and hits the Himalayas. And normally that wind blows and brings the monsoon. And when it's hot, the air rises over the horn, it disappears and, and it sort of carries the pollution with it. Uh, the air isn't clean, but it's breathable. But in the winter, when it gets colder and the temperatures drop to the single de degrees uh, Celsius, uh, you have a, a situation where the, it's not warm enough for the sun to heat the ground up and, and cause this air to rise. And so um, uh, Lahore gets uh, trapped. Uh, the air gets trapped in this layer and it starts to get smokier mm. and smokier and it becomes, you can taste it and smell it and see the pollution. And I mean, it's, 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 it's horrific. It's like Blade Runner 2049, you know, it's this, yeah. Uh, this is futuristic, but hellscape futurism. So, so yeah, Lahore is, right. it's a, it's an ancient creaking, large, beautiful, polluted, messy place. Ah, oh, wow. What a list of adjectives. And the people from Lahore, are they called Lahori? That's right. What, Lahore. Lahore. And what, what is their outlook on life? Well, you know, it's it's one of these things. I mean, a city of twelve million. I, I hesitate to say anybody has a particular outlook. Yeah, we, we, I know. There's, I know. You know, we have we have our. It's, share. An, un, it's an unfair question, yeah. but you're also a, you're well, also a very astute, perceptive writer. So well, I can't rather, risk asking you. You know, rather than 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 than, than I think um, uh, say that Lahoris have a particular character. I'll tell you the character people think that Lahoris have, um, and okay. you, you can judge for yourself. Uh, whether you believe that this is uh, um, has you know is grounded in fact, as as you know these things may or may not be, but but Lahori are, are known for being you know friendly, um, gregarious, uh, you know um, 
not particularly prompt. Uh, they <laughs> eat well, they socialize, they dance, they have big, you know, gatherings. Um, uh, you know, Lahore, Lahore is a, is a, is a warm city in, in sort of every sense. Uh, and, um, but, you know, against that historical image, you know, it's sort of like, it's a bit like, you know, the big easy is, is sort of what you might imagine Lahore to be this sort of riverine music, soul infested, um, soul kind of radiating, um, cultural, uh, easygoing metropolis. But, um, once you hit 12 million, you have, you know, you've got crime, you've got poverty, you've got, um, stress, tensions, uh, all of that stuff, you know, it's gotten expensive. So, so, you know, Lahore probably isn't what it used to be, but it was, you know, it's been known to be a city of, of, um, of, of good food, good music, Sufi poets, mystics, mm. um, you know, mm. literature and music and, and food and parties, you know, I guess historically. Uh, yeah. Not, not what it used to be and not yet what it will be. Um, but you've given us such a great little dot of that, of your part of the world today. And I, I, as somebody, I guess who you were including in the word you for all, <laughs> for all those early sentences, it's so, uh, beautiful to hear somebody from their native city and country and part of the world describe it with such elegance. Thank you for doing that. Most no, my pleasure. Um, to get, to kind of transition us now, kind of zooming in, like, so you go, you know, uh, from the planet to the country, to the city, now to you, I thought we could kick us off before we get to the three books, which you've kindly given us, uh, which I've, I've really enjoyed going through in advance of this. Um, I thought I could give you three quotes you have said about books or writing to offer to you for you to expand, explain, or elucidate as you see fit. You can, or as George Saunders told us in chapter 75, or you could deny, you could deny them as well. <laughs> uh, from, 2000, from 2017, The Guardian, you said, storytelling offers an antidote to nostalgia. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that George Saunders would say that because, um, you know, in a way, the person that one is now isn't the person that one was. And so, you know, when I look back at my books, they, they, they were written, I suppose, all by me, but they were written by different me's in, in different times. Um, and so you never know if a quote you're going to get is one that you <laughs> agree with or, or, or sort of scratch your head and disown. And especially, when I, especially when I'm pulling some of them from your nonfiction and I'm pulling some of them, as you'll see in a moment, from fiction as well. Okay. So they're just, they came from your fingers or your mind, but I, 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 do not, I do not attach them to you in any other way other than how you want to receive them right now. Well, I think, you know, um, nostalgia is a an incredibly potent force, uh, particularly now, because uh, as the pace of change accelerates, you know, and we, uh, like any organism, um, you know, we have a, a fairly limited capacity to adjust in one lifetime to things. Um, you know, we can, we imagine that we can adjust a great deal and we can, you know, we can move across the world and learn a new language and do all sorts of stuff. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's difficult for us to grapple with, you know, the arrival of electricity and then the automobile and then the internet and then um, constantly um, engaging with an internet that, that ranks. The metaverse. Yeah. And that ranks each of our comments and tells us how attractive we are, or how funny we are, <laughs> or how stupid yeah. we are, um, yeah. uh, and, and gives us <laughs> metrics for those things. Um, you know, we, uh, um, I think that, I think that, in, in, in times of rapid change, which is to say now, um, and presumably uh, every moment going forward where change is likely just to accelerate, uh, uh, there is this desire um, to go back, uh, to, to go back to one's memories, um, even imagined memories, uh, and to reimagine them and to imagine things as, as being better. And that's a normal human phenomenon because um, as we get older, the idea of being when we were younger, being a better time, of course, takes hold because you know we were uh, more fit then, and uh, we had more time and less responsibility, and you know more hair or whatever it was, and mm -hmm. um, and so and so the personal feeling 
uh, of nostalgia for youth, um, uh, uh, which is a, which has always existed, comes into contact um, and is magnified by an increasingly rapidly changing environment, uh, and particularly uh, an environment which now constantly provides us a sense of stress um, and anxiety in the form of, of, of frightening information because there's a war on for our attention. Um, the marketplace really now is a marketplace for our attention. And we give attention to threats um, much more readily than to anything else. And so we are constantly being subjected to threats. Somebody's invading, somebody's attacking, somebody's in like your kind of people, somebody's um, you know, coughing in a different way. And, uh, and so we're, we're in this heightened state of, um, of, of feeling threatened. Uh, and, and as a result, the nostalgic impulse becomes very strong and it, it starts to couple into um, potent political forces that want to take us back to times when everybody looked like us and spoke mm. like us. And, make and, America great again. Yeah, you know, make America mm -hmm. great again or make mm -hmm. uh, uh, Islam the Islam of the 8th century again or make, you know, Europe the Europe before immigration again or, you know, whatever. Make day. England before Brexit, before um, the EU exactly. again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, and of course, you know, we can't go back. So just as in our bodily, physical lives, if I were to attempt to become 18 again, the result is probably something quite monstrous. You know, I'd have to do all sorts of surgeries and sorts of <laughs> stuff. Um, and, and, and also kind of brainwash myself into acting like I was 18. Um, uh, and, uh, and I wouldn't be 18, right? I would just, I would just be trying to convince myself and look like I am. Uh, and in much the same way, I think, you know, there's a kind of monstrousness that is possible. Um, uh, and I say, you know, without a lack of sympathy, I mean, I, I am sympathetic to the desire to be 18 again or the desire to live in the countries that we were born in 50 years ago or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But um, that said, I think the desire to get there very often um, takes on sort of monstrous overtones. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in India, for example, you know, the idea of returning to um, a land of Hindus before the Muslims arrived and the Muslims arrived you know, mm -hmm. a thousand years ago. So, uh, uh, you know, Pakistan is the same and, and Canada, America, Europe, you know, China, Turkey, Russia, uh, there's no country that isn't yeah. seeing this. I, I don't want there, to there are laws that come up sometimes in Quebec and I, I, I don't want to speak because I don't know them, but they ban people from wearing hijabs or headdresses as, you know, municipal government in Quebec. And it's always a very debatable, controversial thing. But the root of that sounds like the same thing you're talking about. Yeah. Make Quebec, Quebec again, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, I think mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we are up against this incredibly potent nostalgic impulse. And it manifests itself in exactly the kind of politics and policies that we're, that we're talking about. Um, but we do have... Uh, in our culture uh, uh, and our history, we do have ways to um, achieve at least partial inoculation or partial antidotes against this feeling. Um, unfortunately, those, those mechanisms have largely been uh, degraded and disrupted and destroyed. So, you know, whether it was religious faith that allowed people to... Um, say that, okay, things are changing and maybe not the way I'd like them to change, but a better, um, you know, a better future awaits us in the hereafter, for example. Um, and, uh, and despite, I think the growing, you know, what we hear is like growing sounds of religious conflict all over the world. Um, my sense is that there has been a profoundly, you know, a profound weakening of, um, of the spiritual, you know, side of, of religion as, mm -hmm. as religion has been, increasingly tied into a sort of political, um, you know, tribal identification role. I belong to my religion, you belong to yours, and that, that allows us to identify. And religion has always, of course, had that, but, but the important role of, of also just um, uh, giving some way of dealing with this sense of crisis that happens in the course of a lifetime, I think is being weakened. Um, you know, alongside that, um, things like family, extended family and clan, you know, those are being weakened as people move and, um, and have to move, uh, displaced by economics or, 
uh, by the modern market economy or by climate change or whatever it is. Um, you know, people increasingly uh, do not live uh, among the people that their ancestors lived among. Yeah. And, and so, Un- unlike what you're doing right now with the fourth generation of yeah. kids <laughs> around, it's very unusual though today to hear that, to hear a sentence like that. Well, you know, we, 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 I go in circles. So, you know, we dip back into Lahore for a bit and head back off to New York or London. And then, you know, my life, my life is sort of um, a series of rotations. I think it's, 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 more, it's more like the planet sort of going around the sun. I don't think I'm, I'm fixed in a point. But yes, um, on that sort of uh, spiraling journey, the return to Lahore for long periods of time has is, is certainly been part of it. And, um, and so, and so, you know, if, if, if family and clan is, is breaking down, um, if spirituality and religion is being, is being, uh, uh pushed aside in, in the name of, of politics. Um, and if, you know, our folk tales and, um, and, and sort of cultural, storytelling um, that we had that helped us to sort of figure out where we stand was another pillar. Um, that too was knocked out, right? Like, you know, what are the folk tales of, of uh, Toronto or Lahore now? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do my kids yeah. know what those are? And, and would they even think of them as a source of guidance? But, but for all of that, I think storytelling remains important. And so, and so, um, uh, the quote that we we began you know discussing right now was mm-hmm. was to do with um, what storytelling offers an antidote to nostalgia. Yeah, what storytelling can do because because mm-hmm. um, storytelling allows us to uh, imagine places we haven't yet been uh, mm. that's because um, those places don't exist in time whether it's because they don't yet exist geographically, we aren't in those places, whether it's because um, the people who inhabit the stories are, are not what we ourselves are. Um, whatever it is, storytelling allows us to go elsewhere. And, uh, and to a certain extent, storytelling allows us to sort of prototype alternative lives and alternative futures, you know, and sort of wow. inhabit those, right? It's like, you know, you get to beta test um, what it's like to be a woman if you're a man, or what it's like to be in Pakistan if you live in Toronto, or what it's like to be, you know, left-handed if you're right-handed, or whatever it is. Um, you know, what it's like to live in a house with 20 people if you live alone. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think I think that's very important because um, unless we begin to explore stories that look forward into where humanity might be headed, um, it'll be very difficult for us to. Uh, to come up with, you know, plausible, desirable futures for ourselves. And if we can't come up with plausible, desirable futures, things that we actually could imagine liking and things that might actually come to exist, if yes. we can't think of those things, then we descend into, I think, a pretty profound state of depression. Um, yes. depression to a certain extent, by definition, is being unable to imagine a plausible, desirable future. And I think as a civilization, yes. we're in that place. And I, you know, I think what, you know, on the one hand, we have these sort of techno utopias where tech will solve stuff, and yet I'm not sure that that's, that works. You know, I think I don't think um, tech does that. You know, I think in the same way that you know the wheel, it's a great thing, right? But it doesn't give us utopia. Uh, neither does the spear. Uh, um, I'm not sure that tech is going to get us there. Although I think you know it, it's helpful, obviously, uh, in so many ways, but. Um, but it's, it's, you know, to a certain extent, limited in, in how it allows us to conceive of where we're headed and, and what we imagine our future to be like. Um, in some ways, it, 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 it's, its potential is counterbalanced by the sense of anxiety it creates in disrupting what, we, yeah. what we're not used to today. So it's sort of net neutral in a sense to how we feel about yeah. it. Yeah, to, to, to you to you and to yeah. maybe to me, but to a lot of people, it's, it can be a, you know, we interviewed in chapter 101 of this podcast, Daniels, the, the writer director team behind this movie, everything, everywhere, all at once. And in that interview, um, Daniel Scheinert said, of course, people disappear into video games where it is a meritocracy. It's like, you can actually spend a few hours and learn a skill and get points. Life doesn't work that way, but it's so aspirational that you kind of might want to just live there. That's kind of what I think the risk could be, yeah. you know, potentially. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think I think that's right. Um, uh, 
you know, people disappear into video games um, is interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, what happens in that existence? It's unclear. Um, it's a strange world where, where uh, in a sense, that becomes a direction for many of us to follow. Uh, you know, I was a dreamer as a kid, and I was disappearing into um, the video games of my era, uh, which is to say, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and these kind of role playing. Mm. Lord of the Rings. I think you said you read a lot of. Yeah, I read that stuff. You know, I, I lived the life of fantasy, and I was completely in it. And I write novels now, which is really not that different from disappearing into video games in the sense that you just go into your mind and you make stuff, uh, and then yeah. you get with other people. Um, but but all of that said, I think. Um, I think that uh, um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't strike me that people who play a lot of video games um, are less anxious than the other people I meet. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, even if in the playing of the video game, they feel they're in a better place. Um, and, and so I guess where I think writing and fiction has a role is to sort of start, you know, noodling away at this stuff. Um, you know, what would it be like to live in a world where everybody could move, you know? Um, what would it be like to live in a world where racial identity collapsed? Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, who knows? But, yeah. um, but, but it's worth beginning to go into these places and I think exploring them and seeing what we can do there. Um, because uh, uh, there's enormous fear around these sorts of topics. And, you know, possibly by going and inhabiting these places, we can, we can lessen the fear and also start to see, say that, look, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe in fact, in some ways it's nice in the same way that maybe somebody will tell me, look, you might find a life lived in video games to be anxiety inducing, but your kids are going to be just fine and they're going to love it. Um, that yeah. but, but I think that's it. We, we, we need to craft stories that make sense of this world around us. And that's, that's part of the job of, of, of literature. And, uh, and so I think, I think it does have an important role in, in a time of nostalgia. Wonder. Oh, that's amazing. That was such a beautiful, thoughtful examination of that quote. I, I felt like I gave you the tip of an iceberg and we went a thousand feet below the ocean kind of surface there. Thank you for, for that expansion and that color. I think I want to get to your formative books. I also have a lot of quotes I pulled out here. So what I'm going to do most, and if it's okay with you, is I'm going to read you three of them now. And then if one of them jogs something that you are able or would like to expand on, which I would love, please feel free. But if not, I just want these quotes to sort of sit in the picture of the of the conversation. And uh, and I'll offer them to you now, okay? I'll, I'll give you three quotes that you have, you have said purportedly. <clears throat> Number one, also from The Guardian, I do not think that being a novelist is good for anyone's mental health. Okay, that's one. Two, the opening line of how to, how to get filthy rich in rising Asia, which is, I mean, that book, I have bought so many copies for people. It's really, 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 really wonderful. Um, the opening line of your 2013 novel, How to Get rich in, Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, is, look, unless you're writing one, a self-help book is an oxymoron. Okay, so that's the second quote. And then the third quote, also from The Guardian in a different year, a reader in the moment of reading experiences a pooling of consciousness that blurs the painstakingly constructed boundaries of the unitary self. Yeah, those are, those are quotes we could talk about for quite a while. Um, yeah, I know. I know. I'll give you, I'll give you a quick reaction, I guess, and then we can dive into the books. But, you know, okay. um, as far as the mental health side of things is concerned, you know, it, it's, it's d deeply disruptive to spend so much time in your own head, uh, you know, sitting there for hours and hours a day. You know, it's a very solitary art form, uh, fiction, uh, writing novels. Um, and, you know, a big chunk of your life sp is, is spent just sitting there by yourself. Uh, in your imagination. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, at least in my case, um, I can, I feel the toll that it takes. Um, and, you know, I'm older now, I've crossed my 50th, 50th birthday. And, and uh, you know, I, I feel the price um, that, that, that is exacted. But so I, I love doing it also, but what's I, the price? Well, you know, <sighs> it's a bit like, the world of COVID 
in some senses, uh, is like the world of the novelist. You know, the world where you're locked in your house by yourself, unable to go out, um, and, and sort of isolated. Mm -hmm. Um, being a novelist is, is asking for that kind of life, Mm -hmm. you know, for a big chunk of the time. Uh, mm-hmm. and so the best I can say is whatever that felt like to you, if you liked it, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, should consider, yeah. you should consider a career in fiction writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, look, unless you're writing one, a self-help book is an oxymoron. And then we've got the pooling of consciousness. Yeah, in case you yeah, the, I mean, that, 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 that book, the one you're talking about, uh, how to get filtration rising issues, actually my, it's my wife's favorite of my books. Um, mine too. Thank okay. you. And, and, you know, and, uh, um, it, it, it really is about, you know, what is writing and what is reading and and what happens to us. Uh, um, But uh, I wrote that book in large part to help myself. I think I write all my books to help myself. Uh, And, um, and, and so, and so that book sort of begins with this notion that, you know, uh, if a book is marketed to you, it'll be good for you, which I think a lot of literature is to a certain extent, like read this, this is good for you. This is the way things are in Pakistan, or this is the way things are there or where ever or with this person or that kind of person. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 I suspect that aspect of what books do is perhaps oversold. Like after reading a book, you will understand, you know, this experience. You, you may or may not, but, but, um, uh, but I think approaching a novel in that way, that you're coming to the novel because it's good for you um, is a tricky thing. And so, and so what I was trying to explore there is that, is that, you know, as a novelist, I write books to help myself. Um, and when we read books, perhaps we do read books to help ourselves, but it may not be the way in which we expect. In other words, the thing that you might have expected to get from that book, um, what life in Pakistan is like, for example, may not be really what you get. You know, what you might get is a sense of companionship a sense mm. of, um, of recognition, something you've felt, you feel it in somebody else in a very different place. Um, you know, you, you may have gone, um, to look at the natives, uh, and then, you know, reflected in the glass of the window of your Jeep, you see your face, um, uh, oh. you know, floating <laughs> above the, floating above the Savannah and, yeah. um, and you feel, recognized. And, and so I think, I think it's interesting. I think, I think that, um, I certainly wasn't saying that, that, that books can't help readers. Um, but I, I think that, uh, that, that readers help readers actually. And that, you know, that a place yeah. that readers go to do stuff. Oh, readers help readers write that down. Um, yeah, that's such a great metaphor, the face in the Jeep. My my wife, when she was younger, went with her grandparents and all her cousins to, you know, go on a safari in East Africa. And, you know, they spent time with the locals and all this stuff. And then, you know, last summer we were at her grandparents' cottage and there's a picture in the bathroom wall of them, you know, around these small black children with beads and, and there, she, she caught herself and she, she saw something different in that picture today than what she saw when she was experiencing it. And it was so interesting because of course, now when you look at a picture like that, you can't help but feel other things around, you know, perhaps the exploitation of travel and perhaps the, you know, the, the sort of, you know, did we, was there any help offer? You know, there's, there's lots of questions that are in her, stirred inside her. So that reflection in the Jeep, uh, metaphor, just, that just hit me a different, a really interesting way. I thought. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, you know, um, it, it is interesting, um, when we, read our own experience, even just looking at our memories, um, or a photograph, uh, you know, the way we read it changes as we change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have set an incredible, uh, like contextual, uh, We've created a great air here. We've got, we've got the air here is electric and ripe, Mosin, to get into your three most formative books. I have them in piles beside me. I was successfully able to read two. I'm in, 
I, I have not got through Beloved. I'm only on chapter two of Beloved, but the other two, I have made headway. So the first one, let's start off with, well, I'm assuming you read as a youngster, but maybe I'm wrong here. Charlotte's Web by E.B. White, published in 1952 by Harper's Col- Harper Collins. Cover, of course, is that bucolic farm scene against the blue sky. A young girl, Fern, leaning on a fence with, a, you could say, a placid look on her face while she hugs a pig named Wilbur. Surrounded by a duck and a sheep and a spider hanging in front of them. The title Charlotte's Web is in black letters interwoven with the spider's web and the spider dangles in front of the girl. E.B. White, born in 1899 in New York, died in 1985 in Maine. The American author of several popular children's books, including Stuart Little and The Trumpet of the Swan. Also a New Yorker writer and Newbery Honor winner. Some pig, radiant, humble. These are the words in Charlotte's Web, high up in Zuckerman's barn. Charlotte's spider web tells of her feelings for a little pig named Wilbur, who simply wants a friend. File this one under fiction for 813. Mosin, please tell us about your relationship with Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. Well, I spent um, a chunk of my childhood in California. Uh, my, my dad went off uh, to do his PhD there. Uh, he's a professor. And so 1974, my mother, my father, and I uh, flew, uh, I believe, to Hong Kong and then to San Francisco. And, um, and I tossed up there when I was three and, and I left when I was nine in 1980. And, and during that time, um, I, I both read Charlotte's Web and, and saw uh, the cartoon adaptation of Charlotte's Web, which I would later read about and discover that critics, you know, uh, 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 really didn't like the cartoon adaptation. You know, I, I loved it. I think as a, as a six or seven or eight year old, um, and it has, it has this sort of you know, kind of um, uh, status in my imagination. A bit like that's the, that's the vote that matters. I think. Yeah, for the well, cartoon. You know, <laughs> a bit like the first Star Wars film. You know, which yeah. was so good to me, and then I sort of went back and saw it. I, I still liked it, but I, I didn't quite love it as much as I as I thought I would. Um, uh, but my kids, I, I, I you know, I, I've had them um, uh, both read and watch uh, Charlotte's Web, and it, it still had that impact. But it was, you know, it was. I mentioned it because of a few things. Um, one is, you know, there are those books in your childhood that hit you hard, and that make that you just remember, and that make you feel things, and um, and 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 that are part of why one falls in love with this whole writing and reading thing. And for me, Charlotte's Web is one of those. Um, it's, it's a masterful novel because it um, takes on the subject of death uh, uh, as, in a sense, its primary theme. Wilbur, yes. young pig, is a kind of a runt and he's to be killed, but Fern can't bring herself to do it. And then he's always about to be killed. And, and this um, spider, Charlotte, uh, intervenes to save him by writing this words in his, in his, uh, in the barn, in his, above his uh, pen. And, um, but Charlotte herself is mortal. And, um, and the season's passed uh, and, and, and we see these characters age and, um, and what Charlotte's Web does quite exquisitely is it begins um, with this idea of death uh, and mortality as something terrifying. Wilbur, you know, will he be killed? Um, and it transmutes it into something that is very sad. Um, it, it takes the idea of death from a terror um, to a sadness. And that, I think, is a pretty profound transmutation. You know, it's something very fundamental to what so much of culture and spirituality is about, right? Which is finding a way to navigate our mortality without denying that it exists, that we will die. Not saying, okay, no, I'll I'll be young forever. I don't need to think about this stuff. But looking sort of, you know, head on, face, you know, into the eyes of our mortality. Right. Um, And, and... And appreciating the complete, you know, sadness of that predicament, um, you know, mm-hmm. making us cry. It, it's almost, and it does so in a, in a 1952. It does so in a very secular way. Yeah, a very secular way, a very secular way, and also, and also, you know, a very humble and radiant way. You know, I mean, pretty much all of the adjectives that Charlotte scrawls above Wilbur's pen um, are, yeah. are, are, you know, are 
adjectives we could use to describe this book. But above all, you know, you can hand it to your child um, and, and watch them reading and see the excitement and the concern and, you know, and also sometimes the, the tears um, and, and watch this very profound experience unfold. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's in literature's ability to grapple with our greatest fears um, and without dismissing them as insignificant, uh, making them into something um, less corrosive. Mm. Uh, uh, Charlotte's mm. Web is, is a masterpiece. And, and so, you know, if, 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 um, if you want to see what books can do um, with some of the fears that if we don't deal with them, can have you know terrible terrible impacts on our own well being, but also the well being of our politics. Um, it's a fantastic book to start with uh, when you're young. Yeah, it's so true. And you know, we've used this book, Leslie and I, my wife, and we've got four little boys. We've used this book to introduce our older two to death specifically. <laughs> you know, it's been the not the death book, uh, but it's been the book that we've tried to use as a start of that conversation. You you actually have a quote um, where you said, we have a choice within ourselves to acknowledge the feeling of loss that we are continuously experiencing. And that made me think of the famous Saul Bellow quote, which I don't know if you know this quote or not, where uh, Saul Bellow says, death is the dark backing that a mirror needs if we are to see anything. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with, with that with that quote, but it, but it's. I mean, I I completely concur. I mean, I think uh, I think Bello is is onto something there. He's you know what he's reminding us is that um, you know uh, our mortality comes with potential. Um, you know, you think of it as a kind of snuffing out, uh, but it comes with potential because if we can see that every other being around us also partakes of this mortality. We can understand that their suffering, you know, and their anguish is, is akin to ours, right? That it's, it's, um, it gives us the chance to transcend, um, you know, our own predicament. Um, you can, you can feel for others, uh, because, you know, you aren't, the center of everything, you know, mm -hmm. you may not even be the center of you. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, <laughs> and so, uh, uh, it's, it's, there's enormous potential in it. And, um, you know, if we turn away from it, if we, as a culture say, look, we're just not going to talk about this stuff. Somebody else will bury our dead. Somebody else will prepare them for burial. Yeah, um, we'll hide that. We'll hide them. For, we'll hide, hide them death from society. Only a few will attend. We mm -hmm. won't speak about it. We're going to be young forever, and that's how it's going to be. I think the results of that are are, are horrific. You know, I, I remember when my uncle passed away, and here, um, you know, the uh, body is typically shrouded in a white cloth. Um, a rectangular hole is dug in the soil, and then a couple of close relatives go into that soil um, mm. to sort of receive that body and 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 bear its weight and and put it down on the ground. And there's very little space in a grave. And when you're standing in a grave and a body is being handed down to you and you, a couple of you are in there, and other people are sort of, you know, holding ropes or some sort of fabric um, that's underneath the body trying to keep it from falling too quickly. Uh, you know, it's an incredibly potent um, ritual uh, that, you know, that this is your kin. Um, you are in this hole. You will return to this hole. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what it feels like to be in there. Wow. Okay. You know, it's, it's, um, wow. I mean, every culture has so many of these types of things, but in modernity, we are increasingly turning away from these things. And I think it's, I think it's dangerous. And so, um, you know, we imagine that if we peel that, uh, the black foundation off of the, uh, the glass that gives us Bellows mirror, that what we're going to get is this fantastic, um, you know, lens that we can see the universe through. Um, but, but I think that may not be what happens. I think what might happen is we just wind up 
um, with a very, you know, blurry, dirty gaze that can't focus very far. Um, oh, interesting. So, uh-huh. so, so I'd rather have the mirror than that. The pain, the pain of the, of the, um, immortal wizard. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, the thing is, you know, we, we, we talk about, Oh, well, you know, it'd be so great to be immortal. It'd be so great to be immortal. Um, we have no idea actually. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Uh, so you know, true. Who knows how good it Nobody is. knows. Yeah. Nobody knows. Who knows how good it would be, but, but, uh-huh. um, but in a sense, uh, uh, it's natural to desire that. Um, it's also, um, very potent way to be reminded of the finitude of our existence and, and to sort of motivate us to treat it more preciously and that of others more preciously than we otherwise would do. So, so shot as well. Well, so are we just, you just put your finger in this glass that I just want to stir one little more stir because you just said mortality, right? But you're in your early fifties. I'm in my early forties. Certainly, if not us, then our children will probably face the opportunity to have vast options in terms of life extension. I mean, it just appears as though there's going to be some major leaps in the natural biological 120 years kind of to be extended through technology, et cetera, et cetera. When I see those people talking about the Kurzweil, the, the, you know, the, um, what's it called? The, the merging of the human and the robot and whatever the, what I hear inside those people is a love for life uh, uh, is a passion for life is a, is a, is a joy for life. And so I have difficulty squaring that underlying optimism, which I really enjoy with the idea that they're chasing someone, which yeah, is, it's a bit scary and grotesque. And I certainly not something I want myself. I do not want to live forever. At the same time, I definitely want to maximize life. So how do you square those two ideas together? Well, first of all, it's unclear exactly how much life extension we're going to get. Right. Okay. Um, you know, yeah. we might uh, get a lot, but you know, so far the big life extending things we found are public health interventions. Right. I mean, the you know, if let's say people would typically live to about thirty um, in a kind of hunter gatherer environment, you know, without antibiotics and whatnot, um, and they die of you know accidents, murder, gangrene, you know, starvation, whatever stuff would take them out, they wouldn't live very long. Uh, um, and then, you know, somewhere in the last couple hundred years, we zoom up to 80. Um, but the vast majority of that increase is clean water, um, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. vaccinations, Mm -hmm. you know, stopping smoking. I mean, you know, it, it, the, the bulk of human life extension increases have come in these forms, you know, very little of it is super advanced surgical techniques, right? Or right. embedding something in somebody's body that will help, you know, some people, but across the species, it's, 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 it's you know, responsible for a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of, mm-hmm. um, of, of the added life that we've, we've gotten. So and, what I'm taking away is that I'm putting too many different powders in my morning shake. That's what I'm hearing from. Yeah, you. no. What I, what I, what I, what I, what I, I guess what I'm saying is that is that for everybody craving the singularity, you know, um, I would say the likelihood of nuclear annihilation is certainly an equally likely prospect. I mean, you know, it, I, I would look at the public health um, uh, of our species, uh, including, you know, what are we going to do about wars? Yeah. As our war fighting capacity becomes increasingly uh-huh. godlike, uh, yes. we are able to destroy so much. Um, yes. I suspect our species will see itself living much longer if we learn to fight a bit less and yes. all these hatreds much more than if we hack the genome in such a way that I can get an injection that gives me 25 more years. Because if that happens in a world where every country <laughs> has nukes and is using them, I'm not sure it's going to be, you know, so, so I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. In a world where we were all living in the Bay area forever and nobody else yeah. could come perhaps, but we don't live in that world. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as, as COVID has shown us, right? Like, you know, it, it, it's, it's, um, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big, sort of singularity kind of guy. 
Also, well, you I even think- said our species, but you could have said that you could have said public health. Period. You could have talked about trees and birds and li- you know life on Earth. You could have, you know, we yeah. don't have to even talk about our species to talk about the health. Well, I mean, I, I, I would suggest it probably is a much more significant and profound question how we will develop the ethical capability to live among the octopus, which is like an alien life form that we already happen to know that's super, super smart, that we just pick up and twack on its head left, right, and center and eat it like, you know, uh, for fun, right? So, so um, you know, we are all already encountering other fairly intelligent life forms. Um, and our ability to, to deal with those life forms is, is, you know, fairly barbaric. So I suspect that we have a level of cultural education and species education um, uh, that is at least as important as giving ourselves, you know, new powers. Um, uh, uh, so, so yes, by all means, let's invent ways to make human beings live longer. I, I, I would, I would love that. That's fantastic. But, but, um, but it is not for me anywhere near um, as significant a question as the question of. How do we behave in a more ethical and humane fashion? Uh, if we don't sort of that stuff out, then we are, you know, very, very, very violent monkeys with bigger and bigger guns. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that doesn't seem to me like a, like the desirable uh, direction. And I think, I think partly that's where we come into sort of a, a, a very important conflict, right? That, that sort of, you know, this technocracy... Um, you know, technology will free us way of looking at the world. Uh, for me, is, 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 is utterly disastrous unless it's also coupled with a, a cultural, you know, humanistic, narrative, empathy-driven, um, uh, soulful uh, uh, evolution of our species. Um, and, uh, and, and in the absence of that, um, you know, uh, you might be able to live forever, but by the way, my new laser gun is going to be able to chop you in half. And so, so long, sucker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing and responding through laughter to so many things about what you said, including the combination of erudition and so long, sucker. Like that is just, I love that. Okay. Let's use this as a great, great transition point to go from your first book to your second. And I have your second and third books in front of me, Mosin, and I'm keeping an eye on the time. Do you have a preference on which direction we go next? I don't know, of course, which one you read or first in your life or not. Well, I mean, let's, let's, let's take Toni Morrison's Beloved. Um, okay. It's, 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 okay. It's, it's, it's the one I read second. Um, okay. 1987 from Alfred A. Knopp. The cover is white with Beloved in large red block letters across the top, followed by the words a novel in black below. The, author names, the author's name in green block letters in the bottom left. Toni Morrison, winner of the Nobel Prize. Toni Morrison, of course, born 1931 Ohio, died 2019 in New York. The American novelist of such books as The Bluest Eye, which we've discussed previously on the show via Cheryl Strayed. In Song of Solomon, not only did she win the Pulitzer Prize, she won the Nobel Prize, both of them. That's a pretty hard task. And in this book, real quick, staring unflinchingly into the abyss of slavery, the spellbinding novel transforms history into a story as powerful as Exodus and as intimate as a lullaby. Seth, its protagonist, was born a slave and escaped to Ohio, but 18 years later, she is still not free. She has too many memories of Sweet Home, the beautiful farm where so many hideous things happen, and Seth's new home is haunted by the ghost of her baby, who died nameless and whose tombstone is engraved with a single word, Beloved. Mosin, tell us about your relationship with Beloved by Toni Morrison. So I... um arrived at Princeton University in the fall of 1989 uh, to bring in my uh, undergraduate education. I arrived from Pakistan and, um, and we were given a, a book to read over the summer, or told to read a book over the summer, which I neglected and didn't do, uh, called Beloved by Toni Morrison. And, and the whole entering freshman class was taken to this big auditorium and she gave this lecture. And it was electri- electrifying, sort of spellbinding lecture where she talked about the first sentences and she did all this stuff. And it was like... She's a professor well, there. Yeah, she was a professor there. And, um, and it was just magnificent. You know, like, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. 
I've arrived at college. This is, this is, you know, <laughs> that's how we welcome people at Princeton. Tony yeah. Morrison sort of personally <laughs> welcomes you. <laughs> yeah. Kansas City boy, you know, it's like, it was, this, it was this, uh, it was this, it was this, uh, okay. Right. Like this is, this is like properly smart stuff. Um, and, um, and I went on, I discovered that you could take this thing called creative writing. And while I didn't major in creative writing, I wound up studying other stuff. I took a, I took a handful of creative writing classes while I was there. And uh, in my senior year, uh, Tony Morrison offered this long fiction creative writing class where you would, instead of writing a short story, you'd write something longer. And I applied and I was one of the, she, she would pick a few students every year to be in this class. And she, and I was uh, you know, one of the ones that she picked that year. And, and I wrote the entire first draft of my novel. Um, in fact, my, my first two drafts of my novel. Uh, moth smoke? Moth smoke in that class. Mm-hmm. You know, she was probably like, yeah, I'm never going to offer this class again. Like I wanted 50 pages. This kid keeps giving me like entire book. Um, mm-hmm. And j- just, to, just to say for the listener, you're in 1989, 1990, and Moth Smoke comes out in 2000. I'm just going to throw a couple dates in here for people yes. listening. Yeah. So yeah. in 93 January, I begin this course, and it runs, I suppose, until May, the end of the semester. And, and during this time, I write this whole thing. Um, twice. And, um, and, uh, anyway, you know, she would take her students out to lunch perhaps, you know, uh, once or twice if you were lucky. And, um, and so we went out for our lunch and, uh, uh, and I had my books with me and everything else. And, um, and, and the strange thing had happened because, you know, I, I'd entered in her class and she had to read, you know, my first, you know, pages for her class before I had actually yet read, um, uh, beloved, which I'd been meaning to read since that first summer, but never read. And so since I began her class, I was, I, I picked up another of her novels, jazz, which had come up more recently. And I was reading that and we're sitting at lunch and I remember having some French fries and I was dipping them in ketchup and we were talking and I don't know what I was eating, you know, burger or something. And, um, and she, um, you know, she said, what have you got there? And, uh, I, you know, I showed her what I had there, a bunch of books and, and, you know, students have, but among them was jazz. And she said, ah, she signed it for me at the lunch. And, and then she, um, uh, and she asked me, you know, if I'd read Beloved and, uh, uh, and I shamefully said. Oh, horrifying, you know, horrifying question to receive from Tony Morrison. <laughs> I waited for four years to be called out. Um, <laughs> And so and finally, I was called out by the, by the two B Nobel laureate, um, and uh, and I, you know, I sort of you know uh, whimpered no, and 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 you know, and she said, read it, it's good, and um, and I remember she said that, and um, and I did read it, and uh, you know, it was mind-bogglingly amazing. Um, and I think of that book um, for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, one is I, I think it's a masterpiece. It's it's an incredibly powerful uh, uh, novel. Um, you know, uh, people talk about uh, uh, about you know what it is, what its subject matter is, which is which is slavery. Um, you know, and and race and and, and the reckoning uh, America has never really had uh, or fully had um, with that history. But, um, but aside from that, if you look at how it's built, um, if you look at the form of the thing, if you look at the way its sentences are, are, are designed, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's like, you know, it's 20 courses in one for a writer. It's, it's, a, it's an education, um, you know, formally the way it moves around, whose point of view we're in, how these chapters, yeah. you know, where we are yeah. um, linguistically, you know, the, the cadences, the rhythms, how it picks you up and moves you. And, and you know, and if, in Tony Morrison's class, um, a number of things happened. And for me, Beloved is a touchstone because it was, it, 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 it was you know, if, if Charlotte's Web of these three books is the book that, that probably made me want to become a writer. Um, you know, Beloved was this door that I got to walk through um, mm. on my way to actually becoming this writer. And, and, you know, and partly because in these classes with Toni Morrison, a couple of things happened. First of all, she would read our stuff out loud. And she was by far the best reader I've ever heard in my life. 
You know, mm. you could have read the back of a cornflake box and you would have thought, oh, <laughs> goodness, like, wow, that's, you know, carbohydrates. You know. tell, tell me more what made her a good reader or for those that uh, no. seek to improve their reading, what, what, what is it? She, you know, um, she saw so much richness and potential in language and she expressed it as she said it. So she would see the word. She'd always tell me, read slower, you know, and she always said, read your stuff out loud. And, um, and she would read our stuff out loud. And when she read our stuff out loud, it sounded good, right? Like, you know, you, when Toni Morrison would read your stuff out loud, you thought, damn, like I am a writer. And, yes. uh, and, uh, and I can't tell you how important that is. Um, you know, I didn't know any writers growing up. I didn't know anybody who wrote novels or like that wasn't, that wasn't my milieu. Um, and so, and so, you know, weirdly enough, um, having somebody like Toni Morrison or any other great writers we had teaching creative writing in those days, you know, Joyce Carlos was another, um, read your stuff out loud to you or just read it and take it seriously. Open this door, right? It was like an invitation. Um, you have permission to imagine that you can be one of us. Mm. Uh, she was sort of saying, um, you know, it was an incredibly generous gesture, uh, uh, you know, for a writer of that stature to, to read and take the time and, and, and really take the time. And even to be at the school in the first place. Uh, to be at the school in the first place. And, and you know, mm -hmm. I still have my, my, probably my most prized and almost maybe my only prized writerly possession is, is that first draft of Maud's book, which wasn't even called Maud's book, then with her hands written notes on the back of it. And I still keep wow. it. Yeah, I still keep wow. it more steady. Um, also, her handwriting was beautiful. My handwriting is atrocious. So, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, you know, it was, it was, um, it was, I think for all of her students, I would imagine, uh, certainly for all of the ones that I knew, um, it was it was really uh, um, a welcoming in to this uh, sort of magical profession. And and beloved was um, you know where she showed you what you could do. You know, mm. you can come and do this. You can come and write. And by the way, here's what writing is capable of. So for very personal reasons for me, Beloved is, is, is one, of my, my, one of my great books. And, but I think you don't have to met Toni Morrison. I mean, it, it, it really is um, a novel that will teach you so much about what novels are capable of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many things jump out from that, that uh, Mohsen. I hear out, out loud, whenever I've recorded an audiobook of one of my books, I've always thought, why didn't I read this out loud first? And whenever I've said that, the producer said, Every author says that. And then James Fry, who we interviewed back in chapter 25, he says every sentence he writes, he then said, he whispers, he whisper reads it to himself as he writes, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we spoke also you just know, briefly about. Neil, I want, I want to stop you there because yeah. it's interesting you say that. I, for me, it's the opposite. And I think because of this class and because of this time with Toni Morrison, most of my writing day is pacing around in my study with a printout of what I've been writing in my hands, reading it out over and over and over again. Wow. You know, I, I will have read a sentence in my books, hundreds, maybe a thousand, I mean, lots of times before that book is published. So, so um, and I suppose it's something worth saying is that, you know, uh, maybe the greatest lesson I got from, from those classes in that time with Toni Morrison is, is that, you know, um, is that you read with your ears, not with your eyes, right? Like mm. it, you, you might mm -hmm. see it, but the circuitry involved is this oral circuitry and, and your ears. And so the way I sift my writing is I read it out over and over again. There's a wonderful saying about, about the Sufi poet Rumi, which is that, you know, um, mm. you know, he sifted his poems and with his eyelashes, the sands of his poems with his eyelashes until no pebbles were made. And, um, ah. and, and I think that's what you get to do when you read your stuff out loud. You'll never get to the point where no pebbles remain, but the pebbles that remain are the pebbles that were you to remove them would make bigger rocks fall from somewhere else. And, uh, and so, and so, yeah, for me, reading out loud is, is, is a, is a, is an essential part. That said, even I, when I record audiobooks, do hear things differently because reading out loud to myself in the study and reading out loud into that microphone to the imagined reader is a different reading. 
Right, right, right. Oh my gosh, so many things coming at me very quickly here. Um, yeah, so uh, George Saunders uses the phrase undeniable, right? In his book, um, A Swim in the Pond in a Rain, he says, you got to go at the sentence until it becomes, quote unquote, undeniable to you. And when I hear you say that you stand and read in your study over and over again, the part that gives me some writer anxiety, which I'm hoping you can address here for me as it's becoming a personal therapy session, is, you know, if I do that, five set, five times in, I'm still changing the sentence heavily. Ten times, twenty times in, I'm tweaking, I'm tweaking, I'm tweaking. My issue, Mosin, is the 20 to 20, 20 to 30th time I'm reading or rewriting, I'm still making changes, and now I don't know if I'm making it better or worse. So how do you deal with the am I making it better or worse edits that come after dozens of edits? I think I think for me it's that um, I'm not as focused on the sentence. Um, you know, I, I, I you know for me the sentence is 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 you know is just a phrase, right? It's it's a phrase inside. A larger musical passage, and and so you know, um, I'm interested really in that larger passage, and so um, I you know I think about the sentences uh, a lot, but but I am I'm less I guess I'm less obsessed with a sentence as a sentence. Um, I'm more interested in um, what is the movement? And in this movement, um, where am I feeling resistance, obstacles, clumsiness, um, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. You know, another Toni Morrison thing was she said, look, you, you need to keep your reader a half heartbeat ahead of the action of your book. Just oh. like, which is like the Saunders quote, um, you know, and, and, you know, George is another like incredibly thoughtful, you know, wonderful uh, writer and, and wonderful man. I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times and, and, you know, and also an exquisitely, um, fine, you know, oral, uh, uh, writer. Um, and I think, you know, Tony Morrison said, Morrison said something similar, which is, um, uh, the idea is how can you make when something happens, it should be a surprise, but it should feel inevitable. In other words, you shouldn't have known what's going to happen next. You shouldn't know what's going to happen next. But when it happens, it should feel like it couldn't have been any other way. And that's, I think, what Saunders is saying as well. And, and the way we do that, um, you know, the way we do that is we set up rhythms and movements and um, uh, uh, gestures that are heading in a particular direction, right? That's, mm. that's it's, it's your visual language that you're creating. It's, it's, it's sort of thematic stuff you're building. But it's also very much the rhythm and cadence of the language. You know, when a word arrives that feels that it is called forth by the music of what's come before it, um, that word feels inevitable. It feels undeniable. Yeah. Even if that word is a word that is shocking to you. In other words, right. you know, you can read something. I mean, this is, this is what the power, for example, of, of Martin Luther King's, you know, I have a dream speech is, or, or what so much of, the, of, of his oratory was, right? Is that he would set up rhythms. And then even if you were skeptical, even if you thought, I'm not sure I believe in this guy, or I believe that, you know, races are equal or that we should. Um, it's very difficult to deny that the words that come are the correct words. Uh, because at a writerly level, the musicality has been so powerfully established that you can't argue that this word will come next, right? And if it's the right word and your problem with it is the meaning of the word, um, it makes you consider, you know, why is my problem the meaning? Because it does feel like the right word. And that's yeah. what I think thinking about, you know, writing in this way is so important is that you can take readers to places that they will go because the writing has moved in a way that feels that it is correct to go there. And then arriving there, any discomfort that you feel, it makes you question your discomfort in a different way. 
Mm-hmm. This is so interesting. Also, you know, keep your reader a half heartbeat ahead. One thing I think you and Toni Morrison both share is, you know, you have these also vivid sex scenes and and uh, drug scenes. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that if it wasn't ensconced in, uh, you know, literature, uh, you know, I, most writers couldn't couldn't just sort of throw that at you, right? But you, when you lead up to it, it, it feels very natural. And the reader, as you say, goes goes with you to these places. I have a very close friend named Ron Tight, and he was a one man actor for a long, like he did one man stages for a long time. And I asked him once, what was the highlight of your career? You know, because he stopped doing that now and he's doing other things. And he said, my highlight of my career was one time right before my major big reveal at the very end of my play, a woman in the front row had a huge gasp, like, because <gasps> she realized right what I was about to do, right when I was about to do it. And yeah. that gasp told me that I just nailed it. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, you know, the beauty of theater is that that happens, right? That you, that you're the, the performer and, and, and the audience and they're the same place and they come together for this ancient, um, you know, ritual. And we writers, in, in a sense, we, we don't get to experience that, but, um, but you as you read aloud or whatever you do, your own way of thinking about your work, there's the performative aspect of it, right? You have to make yourself into that reader. Uh, and you're performing for your own reader within and, and sort of feeling what it would feel like to be encountering this. And, and so, you know, partly I think it's about making your writing strange to yourself. Uh, Ooh. Process, right. And so, and so because yeah. you've been writing it with your mouth closed, one assumes and typing it and looking at it, I think when you read it and you hear it, it does serve to make it strange to you again. And so you can be a little bit more like that woman in the audience who gasped. Um, than otherwise you would be able to be. Wow. Okay. I am oh, so desperate to ask a hundred follow-up questions in writing, but in the interest of moving us forward, I got to transition this now to Pereira Maintains by Antonio Tabucci, T-A-B-U-C-C-H-I, published in 1994 by Feltrinelli Publishing. Uh, the English version came out a couple years later in 1996. Cover is, a, strangely for a novel, a photo of an elegant man, presumably Pereira, seated on a bench in a three-piece brown suit and tie with a pocket watch dangling on his left side and a white handkerchief in his right hand. He wears a slightly anxious expression beside, behind round glasses and has a mustache. Uh, the book is slim, thin, 140 pages, no stranger to Mohsin Hamid type of fiction. Anthony Tabucci was born in Pisa, Italy in 1943, died in 2012 in Lisbon, Portugal. He was an Italian writer and academic who taught Portuguese language and literature at the University of Siena in Italy. The book is set in the sweltering summer of 1938 Portugal, a country under the fascist shadow of Spain. Pereira maintains tells the tale of reluctant heroism. Dr. Pereira, an editor at a second-rate Lisbon newspaper, wants nothing to do with European politics. All this changes when he meets Francesco Montera Rossi, an oddly charismatic young man. Phallus One, Dewey Decimal Heads, under 853.914 for Italian 20th century fiction. Mosin, tell us about your relationship with Pereira Maintains. That's P-E-R-E-I-R-A by Antonio Tabucci. So um, this novel... Uh, I picked up in Steelite's bookshop in San Francisco um, at the tail end of the 1990s. And I was dating an Italian woman in those days, and, and, and she said, she suggested it we were in this bookshop. Um, and so it came to me, you know, as um, San Francisco, this city, you know, near which I'd spent much of my childhood. It's a very atmospheric city. It's a very, in a sense, European feeling city and, and, and of the European cities it, it most feels like in some ways it evokes Lisbon quite well because Lisbon is also a, a sort of hilly city where the cold air comes off the Atlantic and in San Francisco's case the Pacific um, and it has this sort of atmospheric noirish quality um, and so and the cities are sort of sister cities you know the um, Lisbon is the last city you come to sort of as you're crossing the Eurasian continent and uh you know headed west and, and san francisco is the last one you get to when you're crossing the north american continent headed west or one of the ones is uh, wow west coast wow That's and so then it echoes and you know i picked up that book and i remember just reading it you know lying in this hotel room bed and light coming in and um and i read it i think in a day or two um i was transfixed i was transfixed because 
first of all, it's it's incredible. Um, it's a it's a brilliantly thrilling um, novel, and um, and it does so much in so little space. And that idea, yes, that idea of economy is very is very important to me. I think. You know, when I was a kid in California, at one point they thought I couldn't write and they put me in this sort of special ed classes. And I remember going to this room which had this sort of mirrored windows and and the teacher um, said, you know, ask me to just block print. And after I blocked printed, well, first I wrote and it was you know, incomprehensible. This, then, is, this is this is uh, when you were in America as a Yeah, kid. I must have been in like third grade uh-huh. or something like that. Right. You, you, and, you're, born, uh, you're born in Pakistan. You come to America when you're three years old. Yes. Now you're in a special ed class. Yes. Because they think I, you don't understand. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've so been following here. In elementary yeah. school in California in a special ed class, not far from where I was now reading Bird uh, Maintains. Uh, and the edition I, I, I read was called Bird Declares. It has two different titles in English. It's... it's, it's uh, uh, in translation, but, um, and then she said, you know, start block printing. And I block printed and she said, Oh, you can write very well. You know, your, your handwriting is a bit difficult to follow and you mix yeah. up your letters and your spelling is not very good. Um, but all of that's fixable. Just go back to class and tell them you don't need to write, need to write cursive anymore. You can just block print and capital letters, whatever you feel like writing. Anyway. So I did that ever since. And, um, you know, I made my way through school, block printing and capital letters with not very good spelling. And my handwriting improved. It became quite clear. Um, but one of the things that resulted from this, you know, uh, um, you know, I suspect it was, it was sort of a, uh, some kind of dyslexia, dysgraphia kind of a thing. Uh, but back then in the seventies, nobody gave me any diagnosis. Um, but what wound up happening was, uh, you know, I could think very quickly, but when you write all caps, you wind up writing pretty slowly. Um, and, and I read reasonably slowly too. I mean, my, my wife reads much more quick, quickly than, than I do. Um, and so, um, and so I've always been interested in trying to say things, you know, um, as well as I can in my writing, um, mm. without taking up, uh, uh, too much space. You don't have to write too many capital letters. Yeah, exactly. Even though I type now and I can, you know, I can produce quite a few letters if I need to. But, but I think the way that I became a writer <laughs> was, you know, thinking about what to say and how to mm. say it and try to find other ways of saying things. And so I would, I would always like hand in these essays that were very short. I would, when I went to law school in the States, um, uh, uh, you know, I would hand in these exam booklets and people would go into the exam and they would like write six booklets, you know. And I would, you know, sometimes write just one booklet. Um, and, and I would sometimes leave like, you know, two hours into a three hour exam, having written one booklet while the person next to me was like, like eight booklets written. Um, and, uh, and it, it sort of worked out, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I did reasonably well. And, and so, <laughs> and so the thing is, I mean, in, in these exams and so, and so, um, it's, it's also one of these lessons, which is that, you know, sometimes your greatest weakness turns into your superpower, right? The fact mm-hmm. that you're the only kid in class who can't write. Um, is in fact the thing that makes you a better writer. Uh, wow. Uh, wow! And so, and so, and so, so I have enormous natural affinity for books like Tabuki's that do so much in so little space. And I was trying to figure out, you know, back then, how does this book do this? I remember having a notebook. You know, I, I, always, I always have a notebook where I'm writing down ideas for my next novel, and, and I just keep jotting stuff. Um, uh, I write my novels on a computer, but I, but I write all my daydreaming and like stuff that leads up to the novel in notebooks. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, 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 and so this book is incredible because first of all, it takes the form of this testimonial. Um, and in the testimonial form, you know, Pereira is maintaining. Why is he maintaining? You know, he's accused of something. Has he been caught? Is he on trial? Like what's, ha- what's going on? And doesn't, doesn't say. Yeah, well, and basically, it is a novel that creates enormous tension through form, right? That, mm-hmm. that you feel this mm-hmm. this real f- sort of thrilling, you know, seat of your pants, like, oh my goodness, uh, what's going to happen? But most of that is ratcheted up by form. Um, it's a it's a formally thrilling book, and it's not formally like the op- the, yeah. 
it's not like Beckett or something where you're like, oh my God, I can't just like next to incomprehensible. The form is thrilling, but it's also like completely, I, mean, I can't penetrate this. It's, it's the opposite. It's, it's, there's a, there's a, again, a, a musicality and a rhythm to this, 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 uh, para maintains, para maintains, para maintains. And what he starts to maintain yeah. is increasingly at odds with what's going on. And, and, you know, you, you, um, you begin to feel. And, and so, um, I think for so many of us now, as we live in a world where, um, this sort of dystopian world where so much is being said that doesn't seem to be true at all. Um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. this idea of maintaining, uh, <laughs> what we actually believe yeah. in so this crazy onslaught of, of fakeness, you know, the fake news or the fake, whatever it is. Um, it, it's, it's, it's such a, such a powerful book. Uh, in Pakistan, as Pakistan was sort of this, this, um, you know, Pakistan was a, its own kind of safari setting, you know, from 2001 until maybe recently when other places, you know, I don't know, Syria, Ukraine have, have, have claimed that, um, that, uh, position, but, but Pakistan was, you know, where people went, um, in the news reports to get scared, right? Like this is where terrible things were happening and this is where the terrorists were gathering and here's where there were yeah. mutes and terrorists. Uh, Osama bin Laden is hiding there. Yeah. And then it's got nukes and they, right. they could come yeah. to you. And, you know, who knows? So, yeah. and meanwhile, you're thinking, you know, but okay, yes, but you know, there also are like, you know, gyms and schools and people falling in love and, you know, all the, like what about all that stuff? Right? Like why, why is, why is all we're seeing, um, this kind of narrative? And I think, um, you know, to, um, offer up one's own testimony in the face of this, uh, corrosive, um, mischaracterization that so much of media has fallen victim to because of media's, you know, uh, um, economic imperative to frighten people and thereby generate attention and thereby, um, uh, uh generate Some revenue. Rats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that, you know, all of us now, you know, are maintaining. It's not, it's not just a kind of Trumpian phenomenon to decry fake news. Right. I think, I think, uh, there's legitimately, you know, a lot of fakeness out there. Um, and even the news that, that is ostensibly not fake, um, you know, it, it lies through omission. In other words, you can fact check it. The facts are, cr are true, but there's another part of the story, which is 80, 90% of it, which is not mentioned. Um, and living in Pakistan and, and, you know, and having friends who are reporters or, or acquaintances who are reporters coming here and seeing what was being reported and thinking, look, why is this, why is this the way this is being told? Um, and a sense of frustration around that. So, so I think, I think, you know, Pereira is, a, is a fantastically contemporary novel, even though it's set in, you know, 1930s. Yeah. Um, uh, Sol Solazaris, yeah. uh, Portugal. Uh, as Portugal is falling under sort of fascist dictatorship. Um, it, 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 it's about a, a writer and above all a writer who, you know, reviews and writes obituaries about other writers. Um, you know, it is, it is, it is a, a cultural critic really, um, who's our hero in Pereira declares, Pereira maintains. Um, mm -hmm. a, a fat hero who is sweaty, who talks yeah. to his dead wife's portrait, who, Even who people. really doesn't want to get involved with anything. And, you know, he eats a bit too much and he really doesn't get along with people. Like this is the hero and he has a rising of consciousness yes, through this us. book, through this testimony. He is us. You know, what is Facebook, um, Instagram? What are these things other than a way to really transcend time, right? We are able to now um, have events that occurred in the past and speak and comment and inhabit them and scroll into them um, whenever we want. You know, we are reminded of our parents on the 10th or 20th anniversary of their passing. And we have, are talking about them and all everybody else comes together and videos are played. And, you know, all of us now, after a certain age, have pictures of, of our dead loved ones. Um, and, and, you know, the culture is the culture of prayer on our mantelpiece or more likely our desktop or in our pockets is some device that brings our past back to us, right? So potently. And, and in that world, which is Pereira's world, we are each tasked with this creeping, you know, falseness. Um, and, and how do we try to remain authentic people and try to get to what we believe is actually going on in a world where, um, it seems so hard to do that. Wow. 
Okay. Wow. Amazing. Ah, uh, the 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 idea of economy and a and a kind of a bloating world, the idea of maintaining rising consciousness, and also a thing that you you didn't touch on there, Mosin, but I wanted to tease in here real briefly is. You know, we just talked about Toni Morrison and how she was your professor at Princeton, how she was professing at Princeton despite being a Nobel, you know, uh, award-winning novelist. And, of course, at the beginning of Beloved, she writes a little foreword talking about how, yeah, I wrote this book, Beloved. Then I sort of thought it's probably time to leave my day job, you know, four or five novels in, very, very successful writer. And on page 16 of Prayer Maintains, uh, Marta says, I only work in the mornings, so in the afternoons I have time to read, go for walks and sometimes meet Montero Rossi. And I thought, this is a question I haven't heard you talk about in interviews before, about your life schedule, okay? Because, you know, you mentioned, I, in 1989, you went to Princeton. You, you've you mentioned in many interviews, Moth Smoke, which came out in 2000, took seven years to write. You don't quit your day job. You're working at McKinsey. You don't quit your job. You get a promotion. You end up becoming a brand manager at Wolf Olin's. You rise up to managing director of their UK office. But then reluctant fundamentalist, you know, your your Booker Prize shortlist nominated 2007 novel comes out, translated into 40 languages, New York Times bestseller turns into a movie. You don't quit. You work three days a week. You write the book two days a week. Another seven years go by. You're now leading this brand consultancy. 2014, um, which, you know, how to get filthy rich in rising Asia, which, you know, my, uh, your wife, I was gonna say my wife, your wife and my favorite book of yours comes out. You're then still kind of in the, in the corporate job. In fact, you become the chief storytelling officer for a brand consultancy. And, and, and sorry, baked, baked into that question is a bit yeah. of when do you go pro? When do you go full time on the novel? Cause there's a lot of people listening to this aren't at the place you're at now in your career. We have a lot of people listening who are aspiring um, writers. So I'm partly asking this as a closing question so that I can sort of get a little bit of your life advice for people on the writing as fitting with the rest of their lives. Well, I think, I think Marta has it pretty much right from Prayer Declare, it's very maintained. <laughs> yeah. Like, which, is, which, is, which is, you know, if you love to write, um, find something else to do that allows you to support yourself, that you find interesting, um, but that leaves enough space for the writing. Mm. So, um, a lot of my choices were in professionally was, you know, I think a lot of people were sort of on this track of how do I make more and more money? Um, and my track was more like, how can I make the same amount of money with less time at my job and more time writing? So, um, you know, uh, uh, in a sense, you know, it was like, how do I support myself working instead of five days a week, three days a week and writing the rest and then two and then writing the rest and one and writing the rest. And, you know, and also that it influences where do you live, right? Like, you know, um, is New York or London or Pakistan uh, a place which is more likely to be a place where you can support yourself um, writing and, and doing other things? So I think a lot of stuff goes into it. But at the end of the day, um, uh, I would say it's a mistake to try to live your life um, thinking that uh, uh, writing novels is the only way that I want to support myself. Um, it's, it, you know, it, it, I began my first novel in 1993. Um, I, I didn't leave my admittedly part-time job. I didn't leave my part-time job um, until, you know, 2009. So that was uh, mm -hmm. uh, 16 years later. And to be very honest, um, it was kind of blind luck. Right. I mean, there there are so many uh, amazing novels um, that don't necessarily sell very well. Like Prayer Maintains. Yeah. I mean, between, between among the novels that are really, really good. Right. You know, maybe it's in your power to write one of those novels uh, or to have your novels be novels that you think are very good. But it is not within your power to say that of the lottery that then befalls the novels that are very good, you will get the winning ticket. That that mm. is up to chance, and I think if you if you freight, um, you know, your fiction writing with the uh, with the burden of having to win the lottery ticket, it's difficult, I think, to remain um, uh, positive and enthusiastic about about the writing. So I think far better to say, here's my fallback money, you know, making option that allows me to pay my rent and uh, you know send my kids to school or whatever else I need to do. Uh, and leaves me plenty of time to write 
or, or enough time to write. You know, some writers are dentists. I've got a writer friend who's a farmer. Um, you know, uh, others are, are teachers or whatever. Um, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily need 10 hours a day to write, but you kind of do need a couple hours. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and sometimes you don't get to the good spot till a few hours goes by. Yeah. And so if you can't carve out that couple hours of your day for writing uh -huh. each day, I suspect that whatever you're doing is, is taking too much of your time. So, I mean, it's a luxury to have. I mean, I'm not saying that everybody should just be like, oh, wow, I, I, it's so easy to make a living and also write books. And, you know, this guy's uh, crazy if he thinks the job market can sustain that. I'm not saying that at all. I think, I think that it, it, certainly it can be crushingly difficult to make a living even working two jobs sometimes. But, yeah. but, when one ha but when one is in a position that you can make a living, right, then you are confronted with a choice, which is, do you try to work more at that stuff or mm -hmm. do you try to pick a career path that actually involves working less at that stuff and more time for your writing? And, and you know, now, I mean, for me, I, even now, writing is a part-time job for me, but... But the other job I have... Really, Sorry, it's still, it's still part-time today? Yeah, it's a part-time thing because I've got two kids. You know, and, <laughs> right, and, okay. and, 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 and my wife works, right? And so when yeah. I was a kid, my dad... Got the restaurant going on the side there. Yeah, my, my dad was a graduate student when I was a child, and I would come mm -hmm. to elementary school in California, and my dad would make the peanut butter and jelly sandwich and, and the popcorn, and we'd hang out, and my mom would come back from the office you know, in the evening. And, and so I had a house spouse dad, right? Um, and, and, uh, and now I work from home as a writer and my wife, you know, has her, has her job. And so I'd say like my second job is, is being a dad. Um, uh, so I'm still very much a part-time writer. So maybe, maybe your second job is being a writer. Yeah. Or my second job being a writer. But I think, I think mm -hmm. it, for me, it's not even just the income side of things, right? It's also the other profession is, um, how you remain connected to the world and how you stay part of something that isn't, you know, inside you. Yes. And, and, and so for me, you know, writing plus being a dad and then doing some other work, you know, some uh, volunteer stuff and a little bit of business stuff, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's not that I don't do anything else, but, but my big two activities are, are, are fatherhood and writing. And, um, and I think that in a sense, you know, that, that is also, I would imagine, uh, was, was part of what Toni Morrison was thinking was that, you know, even if she, um, could have, and I'm sure she could have, uh, not taught at the end of her career, at the tail part of her career, which is when I came to know her, um, being a professor and teaching people mattered to her. She wanted to engage with the world. Like she wanted to be out there doing that stuff. And I think, you know, as a writer that, 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 aside from the financial part of doing some kind of work, there's that getting out of your head. And so, and so, um, so I think, you know, my writing advice for people is whatever the other thing you do is, it should be something that gives you enough time to write. And it should be something that allows you to get into the world enough that when you're alone in your study, um, you don't go crazy. Ah, <laughs> oh. Mosin, this has been such a gift. A few minutes ago, you said you you helped people think about the question, what is true? One thing that is so true today on behalf of all the three bookers listening to this around the world is that you are such a generous soul. Thank you for the gift of your wisdom, of your books, of your thoughts around the world that we live in today and the world we might live in in the future. Thank you so much for coming on Three Books. I am so grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Neil. Real pleasure. Holy cow. Hi, everybody. It's just me and just Neil again, hanging out cross-legged this time. Very strange position for me. Um, sitting on the fold-out basement couch. It's folded out now because my my uh, second son has is determined to have his own room, which necessitates sleeping in the basement. I'm basically s sitting on on a bed at the moment. I love that part at the very beginning where Mosin said, "Okay, I've given my kids the Wi-Fi instructions, i.e., stay off the internet," and instead he got back, you know, 
orders for dinner. It just made me feel so much less alone. Uh, if you are a parent, you could probably relate to that. Mohsen Hamid, thank you for stretching our brains like taffy, pushing us in so many different directions at 500,000 miles above sea level. How many quotes jumped out to you from that conversation? I have over 20, maybe 30 quotes I've written down. Storytelling allows us to sort of prototype alternative lives and alternative futures. You know, obviously, there's been massive conversations about the power of storytelling through this show, and we are becoming more aware as a species that so many of the things that we think to be true in the world today, nation states, fiat currency, uh, culture, etc., really they're just you know kind of collective stories that we make up and all agree to so that they become real. Time, uh, you know, whatever you want to throw in there. But I never really thought of it in such an overt way. Storytelling allows us to so sort of prototype alternative lives and alternative futures. Maybe that's the most addicting thing of all. It's another way of saying the George R. R. Martin quote, our reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. Okay, that's just the first quote. How about this one? I suspect our species will see itself living much longer if we learn to fight a bit less. <laughs> Lots of ways we can expand on that. This one, technocracy, or the idea that technology will free us, that way of looking at the world for me is disastrous unless it's coupled with the cultural humanistic narrative, which is empathy-driven, a soulful evolution of our species. Does that not tie back into a conversation we had earlier in 2022 with Dave, the CEO, I think it was chapter 96, where Dave was talking about AI. And he said, you know, I think you're forgetting something here, which is that, no, these are meaningful jobs. And this is what community is. This is the meaning of human. As he talked about steering Walmart, the world's largest company, through their AI kind of trajectory and participating in that sort of high-level global conversation that's happening right now on the front lines. That, I think, pairs well with Mosin's idea. There, the CEO and the novelist come together. Um, and then Mosin really went deep into like a writing masterclass. If you have friends that are writers, please have them listen to the last half of this conversation because how many quotes jump out? Most of my writing day is me pacing around in my study with a printout of what I've been writing in my hands, reading it over and over and over again. Wow. I've never heard anyone say anything like that when it comes to writing. James Fry with The Whisper was kind of revolutionary back in chapter 25. We all know David Sedaris reads that at a lectern and puts little check marks besides the jokes that work. But still, most of my writing day pacing around reading, that's fascinating. Similarly, another quote, you read with your ears, not with your eyes. I love that one. You'll never get to the point where no pebbles remain, but the pebbles that remain are the pebbles that were you to remove would make bigger rocks fall from somewhere else. Okay, I'm going way over three quotes here. There's 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 a lot more. Re keeping a reader half a step, half a heartbeat in front of you, the reader that like kind of doesn't know what's going to happen when it happens. It feels like it couldn't happen any other way. There's a lot. I feel like I need to listen to this three or four more times on the writing masterclass. Mohsen Hamid, you are a master and a classy one at that. Thank you for giving us two more books to add to our top 1,000. Of course, we're not going to add Charlotte's Web, although we will put an asterisk beside it because it's already on the top 1,000. It's number 835, given to us by Kate the Therapist back in chapter 56. That was a wonderful conversation I had in a therapist room. And the quiet hard feelings, which is no longer, I'm so sad to report, it's hard feelings is no longer. The pandemic got it. You know, the pandemic took out a lot of things. And one thing it took out, unfortunately, is something that's most needed in Toronto, which is a mental health and wellness storefront with therapy in the back. Obviously, the therapy is still going to continue. Kate is still going to continue. But that idea of a retail storefront did not make it through the pandemic. Um, so, you know, it's still online if you'd like to support them, hard feelings. Uh, but he... Mosin, you've back to Mosin has given us two books. Number 680, Beloved by Toni Morrison, our second Toni Morrison book on the list after Cheryl Strait at the Blue Asai. Uh, and number 679, Pereira Maintains by Antonio Tabucci. T-A-B-U-C-C-H-I, also called Pereira Declares. It's kind of good that we got two books here because do you remember back in chapter 107? We had four books right? From Latanya and Jerry up in the Bronx on the bookmobile. So that's kind of what we do sometimes. If, if somebody gives us two, somebody else gives us four, it evens out. And then once every 50 or 100 episodes, I kind of, chapters, I kind of, uh, you know, see what we need to do, do to course correct. And usually then my wife sweeps in to save me. Thank you so much to Mosin Hamid for this electric conversation. And thank you to all of you for listening. 
Are you still here? Did you make it past three second pause? If so, welcome to the after party. Welcome to one of three clubs that we have for three bucks listeners. Number one, enter the podcast club. I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. You phone me at one eight three three read a lot. I love your voice. Please keep them coming. They are a joy. Uh, we read your reviews, your letters, and we play a word cloud. Yes, you know it's going to be a word cloud today. Also got the cover to cover club. People listen to every single chapter of three books and the secret club. I can't tell you more about that, but you can listen for clues and the number one way to get a clue to the secret club is of course by calling our phone number that is how you get the clue now with that let's go to the phones to kick it off hey my name is noah and i'm from uh, massachusetts california and uh, i was asking uh why was the book mouse like why did it get banned thanks Thank you so much to Noah from Massachusetts for the question, asking why Mouse got banned. So for those that don't know, Mouse, which is spelled M-A-U-S by Art Spiegelman, uh, is arguably the best graphic novel of all time. Certainly one of the quote-unquote OG kind of kind of uh, books in that genre, if you want to, if you believe in genres. Uh, David Mitchell does not. Chapter 58, shout out. Cover to cover club members. Yeah, basically... So I have a personal connection with Mouse because my friend Chris Kim, who took his own life and whose story I discuss in speeches like my TED Talk uh, and in my first book, The Book of Awesome, he gave me his copy of Mouse, the first two – the the two books. And after he died, it's that plus a blanket are all that I have of him. So I have a really deep connection with that book. I recommend it highly. Now, for those that don't know, it's a depiction of the Holocaust uh, with – cats as Nazis and Jews as mice. And it renders the unspeakable horror of the Holocaust in, I would argue, accessible terms because it's cartoon drawings of cats and mice. You know, it it takes a really powerful and almost kind of, uh, you know, difficult to talk about story and it renders it accessible to kids of all ages and people of all ages. And so why was it banned? Because in January of 2022, it was banned in Tennessee. Well, I researched this and the reason it was banned, the exact quote, is because concerns about profanity and an image of female nudity in its depiction of Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust. Well, I mean, that's hilarious, obviously, because the nudity is in the form of, you know, gas chambers. Um, uh, it's an eighth grade classroom. So these are kids that are like teenagers. Um, and certainly, I think I would argue old enough to have this conversation. I have not talked to my kids about the Holocaust. They are much younger than that. Uh, but maybe I should. And I don't know when I should. But it's eighth grade sounds to me like enough time. And uh, profanity, I mean, I'm uh, <laughs> almost just laughing at that. Is there any kids that haven't heard profanity? All my kids who are all under the age of eight know every swear word. Okay, let's put it that way. Um, so uh, why did it get banned? Well, that's the reasons it got banned. Having said that, I'm not angry at the banning. I'm actually happy at the banning because what I noticed is after the banning, Mouse shot up to number one overall on all of Amazon. And Mouse, M-A-U-S, became the topic of conversation amongst people all over the world. And Mouse skyrocketed in sales. And the Art Spiegelman, who I didn't know was alive, I'm ashamed to admit. Now I need to look him up and give him a pitch to this podcast. Uh, he, I, I saw him like smoking on TV. <laughs> It's crazy, you know, on CNN talking about why his book should be long hair, like a real artist, like a beautiful old elderly artist. I was watching him and I was so excited and, and the book stayed up there and a lot of people from a new generation are like, what is this book, Mouse, that we got, you know, what is this book? Ban so banning is actually helpful to books. It, it It's one of the few things that increases their sales. And I think that partly is because humans have a biological desire towards things that are scarce. When there's not that many raspberries on the bush, you eat all three of them. And it was lucky that you got that little bolt of sugar because you might not get anything until you cross the savannah. You know what I'm saying? We love scarce stuff. Buy now, get bankruptcy sale, things going out of business, uh, last offer, just one left. Y you know how it is. Scarcity. I build in scarcity into all my projects, partly for the same reason. A thousand awesome things. There are 333 chapters of the show. I, have, I make things that end on purpose, including books, right? So when you hear a book is banned, what it does is narrow the 200 million choice set of all books available ever into a, huh, 
why is this one banned? What is interesting about this? What is worthy in this book of not being allowed to be seen? And that makes it more interesting and arguably less available. So you want it more. And so I'm thrilled that Mouse got banned because now, Noah, we are having a conversation six, seven months later about Mouse. Mouse is a wonderful graphic novel that I highly recommend. It is it is a, an incredible piece of art that everybody should own. Although I don't want to get into shooting, you could own it if you want to, but it's a wonderful book. Thanks so much, Noah, for the call. You got me going on a nice little rant there. Okay, now let's go over to the letter of the chapter. And this letter comes from Cindy Sherrick. Dear Neil, imagine my surprise when I saw you dropped a new podcast featuring Nancy Pearl. Then I was gobsmacked to see my name in the podcast description. And then I was shocked, all caps, shocked to hear my voice message at the very beginning of the chapter. Side note, we'd never done that before. Uh, all in all, a pretty eventful day for me. I wanted to reach out to thank you for interviewing Nancy. I hope you loved the conversation as much as I did. You mentioned the action figure, which she shh. But actually, she has multiple action figures, including the one below, which has my favorite line. She stands against censorship, anti-intellectualism, and ignorance. Ha ha. Thank you so much, and keep up the amazing work. I will be listening and sending you my best from Cindy Sherrick. Now, there's a picture attached here, which is kind of why I wanted to read this. And thank you, Cindy. Um, and the cover is a box. Uh, and across the top it says, when an age of darkness comes, a hero must rise. And it says, Nancy Pearl, a librarian, all caps with like this kind of flying at you letters, action figure. And there's the action figure. It's a woman, it's Nancy Pearl, short gray cropped hair, red glasses, red circular glasses, a sort of, um, what would we say here? Like a dark magenta uh, chemise or something? Uh, a thin blue pants and a cape. A cape. That's amazing. It says, she stands against censorship, anti-intellectualism, and ignorance. And she's holding up a book that says L on it and says, bam, behind her head. Warning, small parts, choking hazard, not for children under three. The back of the box, which uh, I really appreciate you sending me this, Cindy, is, you know, goes into so much more detail. Um I can't read all of it. Librarian code. Librarians love to read. Librarians don't like censorship. Librarians think information should be free and available to all. Librarians know all life's answers aren't in books, but most are. Librarians know that empathy comes from experiencing other people's stories. Librarians can help you find your next good read. Librarians are always happy to check that fact for you. Librarians organize the world of information. And there's other like quotes and pop outs and all this and then a big bio of Nancy and a face of her. Anyway, it's wonderful. Cindy, this is part of the incredible community that we have here that we kind of talk throughout the show and throughout the end of the chat end of the podcast club so it was a pleasure to feature nancy in chapter 105 now here we are uh just a few moons later talking about that conversation again thank you so much for the letter okay and now it is time for the word of the chapter and you know as well as i do it's gonna be a word cloud let's go this sort of riverine music soul infested partial inoculation, sort of prototype alternative lives, kind of a runt, transmutes corrosive, barbaric cadences, oral circuitry, atmospheric, noirish quality. This graph here, ratchet it up. Oh, you still hear lots of words to choose from there. Hard to know what to pick. Uh, there are just so many good ones. So many good ones. I was thinking about going with oral circuitry. That sounded kind of cool. Dysgraphia. Um, the way he used freight, I thought at the end there was really interesting. Uh, uh, runt, that's a good one. Anyway, lots, lots, lots to choose from. Riverine, I was going to do. I had never heard that word before. Riverine. Lahore is this riverine music, soul-infested city. You know, just means sitting on a river, obviously. Riverine. But you got to try See if you can slip that into conversation. R-I-V-E-R-I-N-E. -E. But instead, let's go today with transmute. 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 According to Miriam Webster, that means to change or alter in form, comma, appearance, comma, or nature, and especially to a higher form. Second definition is to subject something, such as an element, to transmutation. Well, what's transmutation? I'm glad you asked. Transmutation... Transmutation. Is the act or instance of transmuting. Be more clear. Okay. The conversion of base metals into gold or silver. I remember that word from like 
the history of chemistry in like 11th grade, the conversion of base metals into gold or silver, pretty hard to do, i.e. impossible, but I think that was the original idea, um, or the conversion of one element or nuclide into another, either naturally or artificially. Transmute from the Latin word trans, which means across, to it with the Latin word mutare, which means to change, to change, to, to, to across change, to transmute to change especially into a higher level. Mohsen and Hamid, I'm very confident you changed all of us into a higher level with this conversation. This has been a real feast for the senses. Here we are on July 28th, 2022 on the new moon on chapter 108. And we are going to keep plodding along. I will see you all on the full moon of August 11th in very short time. Until then, let's remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.